thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my conflicts of interest really have nothing to do with bicuspid valves since they're excluded from all the TAVI trials. You know, bicuspid valves come in a variety of shapes and forms, uh, but they're really very common. They're 1 to 2% of the uh, population. the most common congenital anomaly we see. A third of these will have a valve complication in their lifetime, and a third to a half will have aortic dilatation in their lifetime. There are varieties of ways that we classify these. The Seavers is the most common one. You've seen this before. The thing to remember is the Seavers classify by the number of Rafe. Seavers zero have no Rafe. That's the classic two-post bicuspid valve. That's really only about 7%. And then the most common is the Seavers one. It has one Rafe, usually between the, uh, the uh, left and the right. It can occur between any of them, but there's pretty much always between the left and the right. And then there's this, the two, or there's two Rafe. It's really a unicusp valve. And those generally are in younger people. This is what they look like surgically when you operate on them. There's either two posts directly across from each other with coronaries usually 180 degrees, or there's what looks like a normally forming valve, but two of the, two of the cuffs just didn't split, or normally forming valve where uh, uh, there's two of them that hook together. There's only one commissure that really opens up. That's really pretty uncommon. Again, a third of these will have a valve complication in their lifetime. Aortic stenosis is the most common. They represent 50% of the valves coming to surgery for aortic stenosis. They can get aortic insufficiency, they can get mixed disease. None of these are functionally normal, none. There's no normal bicuspid valves. A third to a half will get aortic dilatation. The ascending aorta is usually uh, affected by this. It can either involve the aortic root or not. I mean, I think one of the things that we're finding out is there's these different phenotypes that you'll see on the right there. The arch can be affected, but generally not the distal arch. If the distal arch is affected, it's usually a coarctation and not a, uh, and not a, uh, uh, a, a graft. But there's great heterogeneity. This is the Mayo classification from a normal aorta to just the ascending, which is what we most commonly see. There's a root uh, phenotype that's almost always with a two post with AI, and there's one that infects the whole, uh, the whole aorta. Generally, if we see somebody with stenosis and just an ascending aorta, you don't need to worry about the root if it's normal. The Mayo Clinic and others have done long-term theories on those, and those roots do not go bad. A lot of genes associated with this. It is not a single gene muta uh, mutation. There's great uh, complexity to this. And if you look at this, what we find is in the younger people, we see a fair number of unicusp, which is uh, the Seavers 2. We see a fair number of regular bicusp, and then we see some tricuspid valves. And as you go along, the unicusp drop off very quickly by the time you get to be 50. The bicuspids actually stay around longer. When I was a, a resident and Dr. Laurie was teaching the residents, you know, we used to teach that bicuspid valves were usually just younger people, and by the time you got to be 80, there wouldn't be a lot of them around. But once we start doing these tavers and really looking at people, 20% of the people 80 or above have bicuspid valves, and were excluded from the trials. Now, if you look at what we operate on people for, the number of people we operate on for isolated aortic surgery is really fairly small. Most of these people have either an aortic valve and aortic surgery, or an aortic valve and no aortic surgery. But there's not many that come in with a bicuspid valve, and the only thing wrong with them is their aorta. When you look at these valves, you can see why they're inherently dysfunctional. And the reason is, is this. It's the geometry. If you were God in designing a valve, would you give somebody two leaflets? Well, you want your valve to open up in systole. If you give them two leaflets, the most it can open up to is 4R. It'll never open up to a normal value. If you give them four leaflets, it'll open up to 8R, and you're going to prolapse and leak. So bicuspid valves never, ever are normal. Now, this is a series of, of uh, isolated AVRs and octogenarians. I think this is important as we move forward in the TAVR world, not particularly with this talk, but it is important. And this is the mortality at 30 days was 4%. Remember the partner two trial, that was where intermediate risk uh, started was 4%. So these people would be considered intermediate risk. And remember that for at least the transfemoral arm of partner 2A, it was superior to surgery. And this is what it looks like when we take these people to surgery. The one you see in the lower right is the kind we'll see with a two cusp bicuspid valve in AI. It looks like the standard an annual aortic ectasia that we take care of. So what do we know about this? Well, we know the aortic root dilatation begins early. Greater size means a faster increase. The anus, of sinus, and root tend to be larger than, than tricuspid valves. And the difference remains, even if you control for everything else, such as blood pressure and other co-founders. And age really may be the most important factor associated with the ascending aortic dilatation. Now, the other thing about it, but bicuspid valves is, again, when I was younger, and, and, and Dr. Laurie was teaching us this, 
we generally thought that this was a post denied dilatation. We thought it was a mechanical thing. And then we went through a phase where we thought it was pretty much mainly genetic. And I think we're kind of coming to a balance now where we know this is a genetic abnormality, but there clearly are some mechanical flow dynamics that play into this. There's different elastin between tricuspid and bicuspid valves. There's different collagen. There's different vascular smooth muscle degeneration in a bicuspid valve. These are, these are structurally different valves than normal valves. And if you look at it, the collagen is stiffer. And stiffer things in an area that has to move are going to be more likely to degenerate. If you look at 4DMRs, we, we're really starting to look more and more at functional things. One of the things Dr. Laurie told you in his lecture on mitral valves is that Carpentier looked at static autopsy, whereas Gerald is taking living, moving things. And if we look at living, moving things, we tend to learn more. And one of the things we're learning is that the flow is different through a tricuspid valve than it is through a bicuspid valve. And you can see this vortex that appears in the ascending aorta. That's not normal. We also know that there's more aortic dilatation uh, with or without stenosis. And we have some guidelines. You know, remember guidelines are just guidelines, but for standard uh, tricuspid valves, you, you replace the ascending aorta at greater than 5.5 if it's growing more than a half a centimeter a year. If you're doing a, a concomitant uh, uh, aortic valve anyway, generally greater than 4.5. It's a little bit different from Marfan's. We, we usually move to lower levels. These people have connective tissue disease. And bicuspid's kind of halfway in between. You know, we consider the ascending aorta when it's greater than 5. That's still fairly controversial. I think that's, that's probably being uh, overly dramatic for these bicuspid valves. Family history of dissection are greater than 4.5, fast growing, you know, or if you're doing a, a concomitant a aortic valve, anything over 4.5. Now, bicuspid valve has a eight-fold increase in dissection. That really sounds terrible until you think of if, if you're going to buy a ticket for the lottery and I tell you, listen, if you buy eight tickets, your chances of winning are eight times bigger, you're probably not going to plan your retirement on that. The, the truth is the number of people we see with dissection is relatively low, and it is higher, but it's not a huge number. And so where we start to draw the line to say we're going to operate for dissection, we have to be very careful because these people are going to get an operation. And even a low-risk operation carries with it some risk. If you look at people with bicuspid stenosis and aerotopathy, here, here was 153 patients with an AVR for bicuspid valve that had a moderate dilatation of 4 to 5 millimeters, follow-up 11 and a half years, freedom from adverse events, 93% at 15 years. So you know, at least in the less than five, we're really not going to see too much. Now, there are some differences between the phenotypes. So the people that come in with the uh, bicuspid valve and aortic insufficiency phenotype, they are really more prone to future aortic events than people that have the aortic stenosis phenotype, the one we see by, by far the most often. Surgically, we have a lot of ways of approaching this to fix the valve, to fix the ascent aorta, to fix the root. For a while, people were doing Rosses on these. I personally don't do Rosses on any adults. I don't see a reason to do it on adults. And certainly, if you have a bicuspid valve, remember the genetic abnormality that, that affects the LV outflow tract and the aortic valve is going to affect the pulmonary valve, too. And so a lot of the early ones that weren't stabilized in some way dilated and ended up having to be replaced or repaired. There are a number of people that are repairing bicuspid valves. Repair of aortic valve in, for insufficiency is certainly a growing trend right now. It's probably 20 years behind the repair of, of mitral valves, but it's certainly growing. Bicuspid valves were always looked at as something a little harder to repair than tricuspid valves. But the truth is, is as long as you have pliable leaflet tissues with minimal fibrosis and calcification, you can usually fix these. And in fact, the freedom from, from deterioration at 10, 15, and 20 years and recurrent AI is really pretty good. This is the way we fix these things. What we generally will do for these valves is we'll implant a graft over the valve so that the valve sits inside the graft. The graft then stabilizes the annulus and stabilizes the sinotubular junction. Remember, you get your AI for three, for one of really three reasons. The annulus dilates, the, the uh, STJ dilates, or you have leaflet prolapse, or you have a hole in the leaflet from endocarditis. So this stabilizes both the annulus and the STJ. And then we put these two things together and reimplant the coronaries. Bicuspid valves are, are being considered for TAVR. You have to remember that, that bicuspid valves were a contraindication to all the TAVR trials. Now, that being said, having sat on the screening committee for several trials, there was always a discussion about whether it was a bicuspid valve or a functional bicuspid valve. Well, functional bicuspid valve is a bicuspid valve you were born with that is a Seavers 1 valve. It's still a bicuspid valve. It still opens in an oval. 
It's just not a two post bicuspid valve. But most of them are screened out, but I think in the partner trial and the core valve trial, you'd probably find eight to 10% of these people have functional bicusp. I'm actually going up next week to meet with the FDA, and one of the things I'm gonna talk about is a bicuspid trial that we hope to start soon. Because as we move into the lower risk, and we've already started the low risk trial, the number of people with bicuspid valves is gonna be significant. And if we can't treat bicuspid valves, that's gonna leave us at a disadvantage as we move to lower populations. So conclusions, there's really an urgent need for biomarkers for, for aortic progression. We really don't know all the factors that are going to uh, go into this. There will be some biochemical and some rheologic reasons for this. We need to define individuals with bicuspid aortography in need of aggressive intervention. This is really a highly heterogeneous population. The guidelines, I think, really need to be revised. I, I think that uh, you know we've gone back and forth. You, you do these people at five, you do these people at 5.5. There's really conflicting data on that. And we really need a little bit more of this for evidence-based decision-making, particularly as we move into the low risk with TAVR. Thank you very much.